Hello my dear friends, my name is Sanne and welcome back to another beauty video. And today I'm again going to be combining two of my favorite things which are books and makeup. I have done this type of video once before and I really really enjoyed filming and editing it so I'm doing it again and this time I'm doing it a bit more excessive and over the top and we're going for like Halloween costume vibes because of course it is Halloween next week. What are we gonna talk about? Today we're gonna talk about the book Angel Fall by Suzanne E. Um, I bought this book at the thrift store and I read it over the past three weeks or like I don't know it didn't take me that long the book is quite thin actually it reads very quickly so it didn't take me that long. I got it at a thrift store I read it and now I have some thoughts that I need to share. Um, quite a few actually. So today I'm going to be doing another chaotic spoilery book review while I do my makeup. Just because I like to chat while I do my makeup so it's just kind of like at the same time thing. And I'm going to be doing a makeup look that is inspired by the book. But first before we get into the actual spoilery book review I want to give you like a short summary of the book and my thoughts on it so you can decide first if you still want to read the book and not watch the spoilery review or just you know go ahead watch the entire review make your own thoughts on it on the way I explain it whatever anyway Angel Fall first off a short spoiler free summary for you this is kind of about an apocalypse I guess um, in this case angels have invaded earth after the humans have shot down the messenger angel Gabriel. So the angels decided to attack all the humans, I guess. And it, we're living like in an apocalypse right now. Angels are still attacking the earth. People are trying to, to survive. There's not really many electricity or whatever. It's been about six weeks of this. And we're following our main character, Penryn who is a 17 year old girl who is now still trying to survive in this world with her mother and her little sister. It starts out with them trying to move away to a different place to kind of get somewhere that is a bit more safe. But in that process, the little sister Paige actually gets kidnapped by an angel. And Penryn decides that the only goal in her life now is to get her sister back and do anything, whatever it takes to get her sister back. And according to the back of the book, anything, including making a deal with an enemy angel. That's kind of it. I don't really, I can't really say more about it because then I'll give spoilers for the book already. So that's kind of the premise of the book. Um, so yeah, angels have attacked the earth. A little girl gets kidnapped, her sister is there to attempt to rescue her, I guess. So, that's like a little summary of the book. My main thoughts, I would give it like 2.5, maybe 3 stars. It's a young adult book. Um, you can definitely tell that it's a young adult book, the way it's written. So, you know, the, the writing style isn't very extravagant and interesting. It's very simple, very basic. Also makes it a very light read, so that's I sometimes I enjoy that, you know. There are a few things in this book which I will touch on later, which make me highly uncomfortable. And I just want to spew some thoughts on that. But that is a big reason that it's not gonna go any higher than three stars, because there's just some things in there that make me really really uncomfortable and that I don't know. You'll get it. I'll, I'll explain everything later. Anyway, lots of things that made me uncomfortable. The writing style is a bit whatever. It's not special. There are a few plot holes but in general the storyline just plays from one point to another. Gets where it needs to be. I don't know. It was an enjoyable read but there were just a few things like wrong with this book that really bothered me. So that's why it doesn't get such a high rating. But it's also why I thought this would be a very interesting book to do this spoilery book review on. Because I just want to explain all my thoughts and it's gonna be interesting. And I've had this idea for this makeup look in my mind ever since I started reading this book. So you know, we just gotta do it. 
that was like my basic thoughts, spoiler free. So from here on, I'm gonna put a ginormous warning in case you still don't understand. This is gonna be a spoilery book review. I'm gonna explain the entire book from beginning to end. I'm gonna explain everything that's in there, all the main important parts and whatever. So if you don't want to hear that, stop watching, please. And also I wanna give a slight trigger warning. Nothing too excessive, but this book does have some like graphic descriptions um of gory details i'm not gonna read anything from the book i do have to mention a few things for the story to make sense but i'll try to keep it as light as possible but if like gory graphic things aren't really your thing then that is something you should look out for from now on we're treading into dangerous territory and we're gonna be starting this book review let's get into angel fall together i'm gonna start with putting our hair up and I'm gonna try to not talk too much about all the products I'm using and such. Um, you can see what I'm doing. If I'm doing anything specific or special, I'll mention it maybe. But all the products that I'm using, I'll list them all down below. Because otherwise this video is gonna be hours long if I'm also gonna be interrupting myself about my makeup the entire time. Okay, let's get started. Before we get into the book, I do want to mention immediately like what I'm going to be doing because I'm going to make an attempt at doing fake bleached brows, which I've never done before. Um, so wish me luck, I guess. The book starts off with Penryn, the main character, um, her little sister Paige, and their mother, who I don't believe has a name in this story. And they are currently residing in an abandoned building. Like, I don't know, somewhere in America. Um, I think they were in like, somewhere around Silicon Valley. Immediately, some things are being made clear about these characters. Penryn is kind of like the caretaker of the group, I guess. Um, she is immediately written down as the cool badass girl who does everything on her own and has to take care of her family because her little sister who is about 10 like no who's about eight years younger than her I think Paige is nine and Penryn is 17 she is paralyzed from the waist down I believe and she uses a wheelchair so Penryn is kind of the caretaker and her little sister Needs a bit of help uh, with her wheelchair. And their mother apparently has paranoid schizophrenia. Um, which I will talk about in a little bit. I'll get to that. Let's just start the story first. So, we are in an abandoned building about six weeks into this angel apocalypse. Which we don't know that much about at the beginning of this story. We don't really know why the angels attacked. We just know that the humans shot down Gabriel. Uh, the messenger angel. And after that, the angels attacked. I think that's kind of what happened. I might be wrong, but... I assume that's what happened. But the three women are making, are getting themselves ready to move to a different spot because apparently the location that they're in, there's a lot of gangs, um, whatever. So they don't really feel safe there anymore. And they feel like it's definitely the need to go out and find a new place currently before they get attacked by some sort of gang. So they decide to move during the night, which not a lot of people dare to do because at the night is when the angels come, apparently. They're walking through the streets of Silicon Valley or wherever they are. Penryn runs into a bit of a scary but beautiful sight because while they're fleeing, they see one single absolutely beautiful white clean feather slowly falling down in front of them which is you know the bearer of bad news the moment it's all gonna go down they hide behind a car and within a few seconds a lot happens because one angel an angel with absolutely beautiful white wings who she calls in her brain snowy 
falls down on his back on top of a car and he is followed by four different angels and the angels all have like different looks like one of them is more like I don't know tiger print or whatever but it looks as if the angel with the white feathers is fighting with the other four angels um, and you know the three humans we're following are kind of just hidden so they are looking at everything that's going on and they see these four angels fighting this one angel with the beautiful white feathers. I want to emphasize that because Penryn emphasizes that a lot. The four angels attack the white angel and then he loses somehow. And one of the angels with black wings cuts off the white angel, the white winged angel's wings. Oh my gosh, he senses. So. His beautiful wings are cut off. Penryn says to her mother and her sister, like, you guys gotta run because we don't know what's gonna happen here. So you guys run and I'll distract them uh, with something else. And she notices the sword of the fallen angel laying on the floor. Also, yes, the one angel that fell down, like, from the sky onto the car. It's like foreshadow wow so the angel without wings his sword had fallen on the ground and she runs towards it throws it at him kind of to help him i guess to kind of distract the other angels so in the meantime her sister and her mother can run but um something happens i don't know what i don't remember and the angel like one of the angels notices that the sister and the mother are running so there's still a bit of a fight going on between the angels and whatever and they decide that they're losing from the angel without the wings and they try to fly off but then one of the angels goes back down and picks up Paige and flies off with Paige so the little sister has been kidnapped by the angels. Penryn is left in the streets with a dying angel without wings on her hands. And her mom has run off and she doesn't know where she is. So Penryn is alone with this angel. Her thoughts are, of course, I need to save my little sister. We gotta figure out a way to do that. And maybe this angel here, who is who looks almost dead... Um, maybe he knows where to find Paige. So I do need him. So maybe I should bring him and get some information out of him. So she puts him in Paige's wheelchair, which is of course left behind. And she grabs the wings and the sword and she goes off with this angel. She just leaves her mom behind because she doesn't know where she is. And she's like, ah, she can fend for herself. We gotta find Paige. So... She runs off with the angel. So she moves this angel into an abandoned office building. She picks an office building with a body in the front hall. Because she thinks like... Like I was almost too scared to go in here. So maybe someone else who sees this will also be too scared to go in here. So we'll be most safe here. Maybe. So that is her thought process which okay sure and she tries to kind of chain down the angel so she can interrogate him later so she's in this office building with this angel and she's kind of like just staying there waiting for him to wake up and he's in this like eternal slumber trying to recover from getting his wings cut off um and at one point she he does wake up and she kind of gets to interrogate him but he isn't really letting loose on any details and you can tell that he's like, you know, thinking a bit low of her because she's only a human, a petty little human. And I don't know, that's kind of, you know, the interaction. At one point, I think this is the moment we're gonna get into this. At one point, Fenrin gets back to the office space from like going out and trying to find her mum or something. And then she gets back and suddenly the body in the hallway that was just laying there, normally dead, was desecrated. And it's just so weird because she's like, okay, good, my mum found me. And I'm like, what kind of weird shit is your mum into? But this is a theme throughout the entire book that makes me really, really angry, actually, because continuously it is said that her mom is schizophrenic 
And then they continued the list of these weirdly creepy things like desecrating bodies, um, leaving rotten eggs for your children. It is implied that she is um, responsible for the fact that Paige no longer can walk. All those sorts of things. And it is all implied that her mom does this because she has schizophrenia. Oh my god. Like, people with schizophrenia don't just go around blasting stuff around about the devil and then desecrate a corpse. I feel like it, it, it just puts such a weird uh, negative stigma on mental health issues. Wow, it just made me so uncomfortable throughout this entire book. Like, people with schizophrenia, like, I assume, usually don't do stuff like that. And it just puts such an incredibly negative connotation on the illness. Well, you know, just because someone has a mental illness doesn't mean they're an absolute psycho. There is a difference between them. And this is just the theme that runs throughout the entire book. Every single weird thing that happens. Um, and my creepy thing, a lot of it is put down to her mom having schizophrenia. And it's just weird to me. This is kind of the moment, like, her mom is there, but she doesn't let her mom know that she actually has an angel captured there because she knows her mom will freak. But she continues to, like, interrogate him and whatever. And you can already tell that this is gonna be an enemy to lovers or, like, 50, not even, we're like 30 pages into the book and um, there is an enemy and there is a girl and the girl keeps mentioning how incredibly hot the enemy looks. So it's very clear what's going to happen here. And I don't know, I kind of don't like that, that it happens so fast, but whatever. She kind of bargains with him like, I need your help, you need my help. I have your wings, I know you can sew them back on and I need to guide you on foot because you're not used to walking and especially not walking on earth so I need to guide you to um, help you get to where you can get your wings sewn back on and then you can help me find my sister which like okay decent deal whatever um, he reluctantly agrees eventually at a certain point they have stayed there for like a few days uh, they get attacked by a group of aggressive looter men and they need to escape and I think like the mom manages to run away already. They just kind of throw in a window so Penryn can escape through the window but then she gets back and she sees the angel fighting. Oh, I haven't told you the angel's name yet. I was a bit confused about this because my brain reads the names differently. Maybe it's because English is not my first language. His name is R-A-F-F-E and in my brain I just read it as Rafi because that's easy to pronounce. It sounds like a normal name. His name is Rafi which is what I'm gonna call him throughout this entire video because that's what I've called him in my brain throughout the entire book. It does say next to it pronounced Ra-Fi, but when you read R-A-F-F-E, you don't read it in your brain as Ra-Fi. Because where's, where's that I sound coming from? I don't know. So my brain immediately is just like Rafi, and that's how I've been calling him every, ever since I started reading the book. So his name is Rafi, apparently. So anyway, Rafi is fighting with these men and Penryn kind of comes back for him because she needs him. She kind of tricks these men by wearing Rafi's wings um, with like backlighting and it looks like suddenly there's an angel because of course those men don't know that Rafi is the angel. I don't know, she kind of helps him escape in that way. I don't know, it's a bit weird. Uh, they fight off the men together. Of course she is a badass queen so she knows how to fight. So she helps him fight off these men and then they decide to just go out and, you know, I don't know, work together. Whatever. So they go off into the world. Yay. And again, her mom has run off. She doesn't know where she is. It's whatever she can do without her mom and her mom will survive, I guess. 
So they just moved together, Penrith and Ruffy. And there's like a lot of pages of them just kind of walking and chatting, but also not chatting because Ruffy doesn't really want to chat. Um, and Rafi kind of needs to get used to walking because of course he, he barely ever walks in his life because he used to have wings, whatever. They do like to mention a lot is how freaking hot Rafi is. I don't know how many times it is mentioned throughout this book, but a lot of times Rafi is really compared like, oh, you can definitely see that he's an angel because no man has ever looked this good. That's kind of the vibe. And Brandon has said this many, many, many many times, which also I want to spiral back to a point I want to make is very creepy because she is 17. I don't know if you remember me saying this. She's 17. Ravi is an angel that has been here since the beginning of time. I don't know how many thousands or million years that is, but he's like a grown ass man, at least. And he looks like a grown ass man. But of course, our hero, she is 17 because this is young adult so the the hero in the story needs to be a young adult too i guess so she's 17 which i find extremely creepy she could have very well been like 25 in this story because it wouldn't have been weird her dad walked out on them uh, a, a long time ago so she could have just still has been living with her mom and her sister at 25 since her mom has schizophrenia and her little sister is disabled and needs a lot more help. So I don't know, her having to be 25 would have made just as much sense and it would have been less creepy also compared to a lot of other situations throughout this book that I will get into. So I don't understand why she has to be 17. It's very creepy to me. Uh, and then we just have a lot of pages of them walking and walking and walking and just chatting and they stay in every house that they can find and eat cat food and whatever. And they just grow a bit closer together because it's enemies to lovers. And then there's only one thing that really stands out throughout these these pages of them walking is at one point they walk past the forest and on the street it's gonna be a tiny bit graphic here they find a few dead bodies from a family and they seem to have been chewed up very roughly like they are missing limbs and the limbs aren't like torn off they look like they have been chewed off so this is something weird that's going on and Ravi kind of makes a little note of like, the bite marks seem really, really small. Um, maybe it's like children or something. And it's like a really weird note to make, I guess. But yeah, that's something that's there, but still very, again, Penrin's first thought is, oh no, has my mom done this? Which is still so freaking absurd. Like, oh my God schizophrenic people don't just go around being cannibals, right? It's just weird to me. It's weird. That entire prompt of her mom having schizophrenia is just weird and it's kind of used as like a creepy factor throughout the book. Well, it's, it's just a mental illness, isn't it? So they see that they don't really know what to do about it. They, they don't really know what happened there. So they just keep walking. Then after even more pages of them just walking and kind of talking but not talking, they run into like a sort of camp they find. Like um, a bit of like an army camp that's set up in the woods. And uh, they find that it's like a camp of people who have survived. Uh, they are not planning to go in there because they need to keep moving and also People can't really find Ravi because if they find out he's an angel, shit will hit the fan, of course. They try to get away from there, but they do get captured, or at least Ravi gets captured. Um, Penrin manages to escape into a tree where she also hides the wings and Ravi's sword. Um, but Ravi is captured and he says like, oh, just go on, you know, go without me, whatever. But uh, of course she decides to sneak into the camp at night and try to find Ruffy. So she gets captured as well. Fun times. Um, this is kind of like the only time I want to mention. One of the very few times that she is actually being her stubborn, I don't need no man, I'd make my own decisions. Um, kind of 
character, which she is supposed to be. Like, you can tell that that's how uh, the writer wants to portray her. But from very early on, she continues to do every single little thing that Raffi tells her to without question. And everything she does is, like, focused on, oh, no, Raffi needs to help me. And I need to do this for Raffi. And it's like, you, you kind of lose that cool character trait of her quite early on in the book. Um, which makes her a little bit less interesting, to be honest. But anyway, she's captured as well. And she kind of makes a connection with Obi, the leader of the camp. Which, again, a bit creepy to me. Because she can tell there's like some chemistry going on. Like, it isn't said how old Obi is. But, but Obi is the leader of like an army type camp. And he has been in the army before himself, I believe. So he needs to be like at least 20. And the way he runs the camp, I'm thinking he's like at least 30. So I don't know, that's just my assumption. But it's still at least a 17 year old with a 20 year old kind of. There, Nothing happens, but there's kind of like a chemistry there that you would think like maybe something can happen there, you know? He's kind of interested in her also because she's cool and she snuck into the camp and whatever. It's still a bit icky to me, like she doesn't didn't really have to be 17. But anyway, they stay there for like captured for like a day and they are told they have to work in the camp because um, they can't just let them go. Because now they know uh, of the camp and they can, you know, tell others about it and whatever. So they have to stay there and work. And this camp is, like, really divided in a very sexist way. Like, all the men are, like, guards and whatever. Um, there are some men who have to, like, do hard labor, like, digging latrines and whatever. But the women just have to do the laundry. So, you know, they reverted it back to the middle ages within six weeks. So Penryn is like really mad because she wants to of course keep going to find Paige and she can't wait any longer to stay there. So she goes off to find Obi to discuss with him but then she gets into a fight with one of Obi's guards who is like a dick uh, and it's like a bit of a weird situation because she's fighting with him. And everyone in the camp just kind of stands around and apparently they make bets on who will win and she does end up winning but like the entire time she is thinking oh my god Rafi should jump in to help me now which where is like her badassery also um again we have a 17 year old who is amazing at any kind of like fighting uh, it is explained in this book but again it is but down to the fact that her mother is schizophrenic. Because after her mother uh, apparently has caused the paralyzation of Paige, she has put Penryn into self-defense classes, like five different types or something, she said. And she has done that ever since, since she was like 10 or 9. I don't know. So that... Um, that is why this 17-year-old can beat up a whole grown-ass army men but it is explained like this kind of fighting with the betting going on and whatever is all done to keep morale high um and get all the frustration out or something anyway that happens but then she meets two twins with red hair who are kind of like gives a bit like um fred and george vibes you know these twins have decided to rename themselves after the apocalypse and they call themselves Tweedledum and Tweedledee. So they let everyone call them the Dedum twins so people don't have to like tell them apart, I guess. So they can just call them the Dedum twins. And these twins are a bit mischievous. And they saw Penryn fighting and they were like, you fight really well, but... This time we want you to lose because everyone is betting, of course, and as like as soon as you start a new fight, especially with a woman, because they have like this vendetta against a woman in there, which happens to be a, a very, very attractive woman who is flirting a bit with Rafi, which Penryn definitely has already noticed. Um, 
and the Didum twins want her to fight with this woman um, so they can see some, you know, boob action and whatever and then lose so they can be the only ones who have betted against her and then get all the money and split it with her, you know? Or like not the money, they kind of just bet with chores and such in that camp. So that is a deal she makes and at the end of the work day uh, while it is getting dark, she ends up getting into a fight with this woman who she calls Slutty, which I want to circle back to later again as well. So it's a bit icky again in my brain because she is 17, but now she is getting into this fight that is especially meant for the D-Dum twins to enjoy to watch. So, I don't know, and I don't like that she just agrees with all this sexual stuff. I don't know why I can't talk. Um, like, immediately. I, and, like, the only thing that kind of she had against doing this fight was that she had to throw the fight and lose it. Because she was not about to lose, you know? But she didn't have anything against it being, like, a wet t-shirt contest for the boys to enjoy. Um, so that weirds me out a tiny bit. No need to sexualize a child, you know. But while this fight is going on, so she does do the fight with this. I think she's called Angela, a person I don't really know. There are a lot of characters uh, throughout this book that are mentioned like once or twice. They do get a name, but you can forget about them. Because they don't really uh, come back that often. So during that fight, some commotion happens like right outside the camp. And everyone kind of just runs away. They either run into the forest to check what's going on or they run inside and this is kind of like Rafi's and Benrin's moment to run away because of course they wanted to leave so they just kind of run off into the forest but then they run into the situation that has caused the commotion and they find a lot of the guards of the camp completely dead on the ground also with uh, bite marks and torn off limbs and whatever. So as you can tell something interesting is going on there but it's dark. They uh, know that these creepy things that eat humans apparently are around them somewhere and they actually do run into those and they decide to call them low demons because they are very very small. Ruffy gets in between them and he kind of fights off these things and these things do bite Rafi quite a bit, but each time they bite him, they kind of just like make a very disgusted sound and spit out what they bit off. Then at a certain point they run off and Rafi just follows them, kills all of them, gets back. And then they decide to run off to San Francisco together. I haven't mentioned this before, but Rafi has told her San Francisco, that is where the area is. So the angel headquarters on earth, um, so you need to go there because if you want to find your sister the only chance if she's even still alive is to find her at the airy. So you need to go to San Francisco. They go off together again. They have found the wings and the sword where Penrin has hidden them before they got captured by the camp. And then there's still like more pages of them kind of just running and whatever. And they talk about these low demons a tiny bit. Perrin does gain quite a bit of knowledge on angels that she didn't have before. So that is nice. She can use that, you know. On their way there, while walking, they do see cars with Obi and his men driving off to San Francisco as well. That's because Obi has mentioned to them that they are planning an attack on the Airy. Kind of as like... A wake up call for people to kind of gather people together like we're strong we can still attack the angels you know um, so they're like oh shit so that's happening sometime soon as well hmm anyway they steal a car like one that they found on the road that still wear works apparently and they use that car to get to San Francisco and while they're there like when they get into San Francisco, they have to decide how to get into the Airy. And Rafi has a plan for this. Because apparently the only way for a woman to get accepted into the Airy is to be 
incredibly sexy so the angels want to hang with you so of course he has thought of this plan before and while they were in a house somewhere he found some very very sexy skimpy clothes and makeup and whatever for Penrin and he found himself in suit and of course everything just fits just right and or like it's maybe a tiny bit too small but whatever. She puts on this very skimpy dress, high heels, bit of makeup. Ravi puts on his suit and he kind of creates like a little harness thing under his suit where he can attach his wings to. So when he is walking it still looks like he has his wings which he needs to kind of like blend in a bit more of course inside. Benrin is looking sexy. Ravi hides in the back of the car and they kind of drive into the area and they get let in by the angels. Of course, them not knowing that Rafi is hidden in the car. They just let um, Penrin in because she looks hot. And this is where we find Penrin's mom again. Because she is currently working as some sort of slave, I guess, for the angels. And she works within the area and she uses like one of those big prying sticks that... Um, have like electricity on the end and she kind of just pokes people away from the um, the fence and it's her job now and again we have a very weird deduction I guess because um, Benwin's thoughts here are she almost looks like she is enjoying hurting other people and I do believe that people with just a mental illness don't automatically really enjoy hurting other people. I feel like this book is very very terrible for the the image of schizophrenia. This is like not good at all. They drive into the area or at least into the fenced in area in San Francisco. They drive up to this big hotel where there seems to be a party going on and that's where they get out of the car and walk into the party which is basically just a hotel that was there and it was taken over by the angels which is a point I want to discuss right now very quickly because throughout the entire book um, they have been acting like the area was this very very like secret place and I was like the area is like you know like Mount Olympus to the Greek gods you know the angels are there and as a human you're not supposed to be there but it was just literally in central San Francisco. Half the human population knew it was there because there were many, many people trying to get in because they knew their lives would maybe be better on that side. Why exactly did Penry need Rafi? Because it was just to know where to go to find her sister. She could have figured it out herself. So I'm, I'm just, I don't know, I'm confused. They go into this hotel. Uh, she is, Penrin has to be like all sexy because she has to be just like all the other slutty women. Pretend that she is all over Ruffy, which she of course is because she has mentioned that many, many times. That he's absolutely freaking hot and sexy and heavenly looking, I guess. So, uh, you know, it's not difficult for her. And now the absolute magic happens because Ruffy and Penrin share their first kiss together because they are walking inside this hotel um, and of course a few angels there know who Rafi is so when he sees one he needs to avoid he moves his face towards a penrin and kind of like moves his head close to her to just kind of shield his face away and she's like I'm taking this moment and she kisses him and it's like a very intense kiss and it's written very intensely like um, their bodies are pulled against each other or whatever. It's very aggressive, I guess. So, yay, first kiss. Um, Penrin is having all these thoughts, feeling very all over the place. And then Rafi kind of pulls away from her and says, you know, I don't even like you. Yeah, a bit of a dick move, if you ask me, because he definitely likes her, you can tell. But he kind of moves towards the next room, because that's where he needs to be and he needs to find someone there and she's just left in the hallway like he doesn't like me what are you talking about which this part bothers me about her you know her stubborn independent woman kind of nature because she has just been rejected that's fine that can happen um she's upset about that that's also fine but the next thing she does is she's like i need to find Paige 
And instead of thinking I can solve this on my freaking own, I'll get some information from any other angel because I can also do them, you know. Um, she's like, I need to find Rafi. Even though he just rejected her, was a huge dick to her, she's like, I need to find him. So she still goes after him and still does every single thing he tells her to. It doesn't really fit with her very stubborn and cool hero nature, you know. Anyway, they're in this different room. Raffi kind of points her towards an angel that she needs to make sure that he goes to the bathroom so Raffi can interrogate this angel in the bathroom because apparently Raffi used to know this angel. She goes off to do that but like this, the moment this angel turns around she notices something about him and she's like he is so pale and it looks like he has albinism and she calls him the albino in her head the entire time which is an interesting way to name someone but then it gets like really gross this this just gave me made me so uncomfortable her thoughts are maybe i can find it and read it to you because when the albino turns my way i catch a glimpse of what keeps the women at bay it's not his utter lack of pigment although i'm sure that would bother some people these women after all aren't put off by men with feathers growing out of their backs and who knows where else What's a little lack of pigment to them? But his eyes. One glimpse of those peepers and I understand why the humans stay away. They are blood red. I've never seen anything like it. His irises are so large they take up most of his eyes. They are balls of crimson shot through with white, like miniature lightning bolts sizzling over blood. Long ivory lashes frame the eyes as if they aren't noticeable enough already. I can't help but stare. I look away, embarrassed, and notice other humans snatching nervous glimpses of him as well. The other angels, despite all their terrible aggression, looked like they were made in heaven. This one, on the other hand, looks like he walked right out of my mother's nightmares. So this reads as if, oh my god, I find him terrifying. He looks like he's from hell instead of heaven. Because her mother's nightmares are always about like the demons and devils and whatever so you know that's what she's implying and then the the absolute gross part of this i've had more than my fair share of hanging around people whose physical appearances are unnerving Paige was a very popular kid in the disabled community her friend judith was born with stumpy arms and tiny malformed hands alex wobbled when he walked and had to contort his face painfully to form coherent words which often let out an embarrassing amount of drool. Will was a quadriplegic, I, I can't pronounce this word, I'm really sorry, quadriplegic who needed a pump to keep him breathing. People stared and skirted around these kids the way humans behave around this albino. First, she mentions a, a, an angel that she thinks looks like a demon and she thinks is very, extremely scary. And then she compares him having an unnerving appearance to disabled children. She compares someone she thinks looks like the devil to disabled children. And also the way she describes these children and the way it's described as if she is like almost a hero for hanging out with these children who look unnerving. It just grossed me out so much. That part just grossed me out so incredibly much. I can't believe someone actually wrote that and thought like that's a good thing. Those are some parts that I really 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 do not enjoy about this book. We do need to continue the story. She does manage to get the angel to go to the bathroom so that's where Raffi is and they interrogate him or at least Raffi interrogates the angel. I, just, I don't remember what the angel is called and I don't feel like looking it up right now. I uh, also don't care. This is the only scene he is in, apparently. He explains some things about how stuff is going around there. Because apparently, after Gabriel, the messenger, uh, died, Rafi was one of the angels who is up for uh, election to be the new messenger. But there is a lot of stuff like between Rafi and the other angels. And this apparently also explains why he was attacked in the beginning of the book in the first place. Because apparently he was like a leader of a like an army group within the angels, and all of his um, subordinates had sex with humans, which is not allowed because the 
uh, offspring that comes from that are like weird like demon children I guess and Ravi was like extremely angry that his subordinates did that and he kind of tattletailed tittle tattled on them so they were like they, they received punishment and their wives were like I think brutally murdered I don't know it, it just they keep saying like something way worse happened to the women um, so I'm assuming like torture or brutal murder or whatever Ravi kind of like snitched on his uh, subordinates and then he decided to move to earth and kind of just live there and uh, hunt all these little demon children down and kill all of them um, so that was his mission so the angels believe Ravi has been on earth for way too long because he has been on his own and apparently angels are like group people so they cannot be on their own for too long because then they'll lose their I don't know sense of being an angel I guess so a lot of people were not really agreeing on him being the new messenger because he would have been on the earth for too long I guess but apparently not many people know like not any of the angels know that his wings were cut off which is weird like I feel like the angels are written down as like such cruel folk they would have at least known how to gossip, right? At least, maybe. So I felt like maybe like they, they should know that Raffi's wings are cut off and that he's not coming back, I guess. But maybe no one is told. I don't know, because no one knew. I guess it's like a whole political thing going on between the angels because now they need to choose who the new messenger is gonna be. And this entire explanation, like it doesn't explain much to me. Maybe it will in the second book. Or the third one but it doesn't explain much in the first book as to what's going on and also why the angels are attacking the earth they tell the other angel that Raffi has lost his wings and that they need someone to stitch them back on and the other angel's like I know who I'll get her um, we meet in your room like in a few hours I guess so he goes off to get this new this angel to help Raffi and Raffi and Perrin go up to a room and just get a room there wait and order room service when they order room service Perrin notices that the person who brings the room ser service is Didum or like one of the Didum twi twins but she calls him Didum which is like weird because they're Tweedle D and Tweedle Dum so one is D and one is dumb and together they're D dumb so they're like you can call us D dumb but she calls this one twin D dumb which is just weird um, they can be their own entity you know she thinks he might be working there as a spy especially since Obi is planning his attack and she's like maybe maybe I can make use of that you know um, but a little later uh, that other angel comes back with the first female angel that uh, Penrin has ever seen which again calls for some very weird thoughts I guess because her first thoughts are wow this angel is so beautiful she could be the poster child for the master race and later on she calls her face Arian which I'm like you don't really need to use these World War Two. Holocaust references, I guess, to describe a person. It is kind of done to seem like she is absolutely beautiful, but she also has some kind of evil about her. You could have just said that, but she didn't. She said the poster child for the master race, which is just weird. I don't know, it's just, it just weird to me. There's like some very weird descriptions in this book that I'm like, that's so unnecessary. They make like a deal for Ravi to get his wings sewn back on. So he goes off with this scientist angel and the other angel goes with them. So Penrin is left alone in the room. So she goes back to ordering room service so she can talk to the dumb. Cause she's like, I know that Obi is going to attack this place soon. I don't, I don't think Rafi knows about this. She's like, I can't stay here and wait until Rafi is back because that might be too late. So I'm gonna go on my own and search. And this is the kind of like independent woman kind of shit that we wanted to see throughout the entire book. She makes sure she gets the demo over there for room service. He kind of sneaks her out and he sneaks her to the back of the building to some kind of underground car park. This is where he 
drops her off kind of and he's like you know you have an hour that's when the attack will begin um good luck i've only heard rumors of something with children being in here so i don't know if this is the place but this is the only place i can think of so go look down there i guess and near the entrance of this this is where we find mom again penrin and her mom go into this car park and they go a few stories down whatever try to find page and then they end up in a creepy place which is basically just a scary lab so they get into this lab and there's like big um tanks with like mutated angels in it i have read some goodreads reviews and whatever on this book because i wanted to see if people had the same thoughts as me or not and i read a lot of people were like i don't like this evil scientist trope because in a lot of sci-fi of course and fantasy books and whatever science is always put down as something bad but i think like throughout this book penrin does mention a few times how much she trusts science over magic or faith or whatever it's clear that the main character agrees with science and i like i kind of i i like the evil scientist thing because i freaking love science and i like to know what kind of obscure things you can do with science and there have been evil scientists in the past, definitely, who have done creepy experiments that should not have been done. I kind of like the evil scientist thing. Also, I am a scientist as a scientist. No, but like, I don't mind. I think it's kind of fun and I definitely don't see it as science is always put away as something bad. Like, but that might be just me. I, I don't see it as something bad, the evil scientist thing. I find it always very interesting to see what people can come up with. But the thing that's going on in this lab is there's tanks with mutated angels. And these angels are like creepy as shit. Because they have like very scaly skin. And they, they have dragonfly wings instead of like angel wings. And they have giant scorpion tails with a stinger. And they seem to be feeding on people that are still alive so they are in the tanks with them and they seem to be still breathing i guess and they're just kind of feeding on them um so that's interesting so penrin is just like oh what's going on and she does kind of want to save the people so she's kind of stuck you know save these people or find Paige. Uh, but she goes off to find Paige because of course that's what she's here for um and she runs into like a room which has piles of children's bodies stacked up against the wall and she's just kind of like panicking of course because she's like what if Paige's body is in here as well so she keeps calling for Paige and then something starts happening some of the bodies start moving and then out of there comes crawling a child boom boom a child no it's Paige of course um Paige comes crawling out of the pile of bodies and she looks a bit different because now she can walk she has been cured she looks a bit weird because she has like stitches like all the way like here and whatever and bruises and whatever she looks very beat up and she looks a bit creepy because as soon as she starts smiling she reveals she does not have teeth anymore she currently has razor blades instead of teeth um so that's a bit creepy. But she's happy to finally have her sister again, you know. Very important. She got what she came for. So she's like, we gotta run. So she grabs her mom, she grabs her sister, and she tries to get out. But that's when the scientist, one of the scientists, walks back in and she's her. Um, and the angel attacks her. But then Paige attacks the angel and starts biting him, like gnawing on him. And then spitting out his flesh in disgust um but the angel's like slowly bleeding to death now i guess so penrin decides to use the angel sword that she still has um oh so that is like a very interesting concept the angel sword it's like a being it's not like just a sword it has its own mind or whatever it can talk but it has its own mind it chooses its loyalty on its own so it chooses to be loyal to just one angel and the reason penrin can use it is because probably 
the the sword has thought like she is here to help she has good intentions she can use the sword so Brennan uses the sword now and she uses it to like smash open all the aquariums with all the scorpion things in it so they die and then hopefully the people that were still in there can live suddenly one of the doors fly open again and Raffi flies in but like very bewildered followed by another angel and then the, the 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 female angel that was the doctor and apparently the two angels not the female angel the two male angels are fighting and Rafi has wings now but he doesn't have his beautiful white feathery angel wings that he used to have he now has bat like black leathery wings with sides at the end of them and then the other angel um, which I think was the angel that actually cut off his um, wings at the beginning of the book. I think it's the same angel. He, I think he used to have the bat-like black wings. So they kind of swapped, I guess. The doctor did that for them. And he's like beating Raffi up. They're fighting. Um, and he calls Raffi the fallen angel. Woo! Which um, the beginning of the book was, you know, foreshadowing because the first scene of him actually in the book is him falling. And I think the reason for that was because that one angel was one of those subordinates that was punished for having sex with a woman, um, like a human woman. And then he was punished like to go live in hell, I guess, and be a hell angel. But now he has his white, he has white wings again, or like angel wings. So now he can be an angel again instead of a demon and he can go back to heaven and now Rafi is a demon I guess it was something like that I don't know I read like it was explained like very very shortly something like that and I don't know if I have it right or not they fight blood everywhere whatever outside noises start happening the attack by Obi and his man has started so shit's going down there's a lot going on and Penryn is looking like what am I supposed to do so Rafi tells Penryn to run um, which she does again she has already told Paige and her mum to run so they have run away they're gone Penryn is still here she hides behind one of the tanks and she watches Rafi fight this other angel and there's like some dialogue that explains stuff a tiny bit like the political side of things and whatever I don't understand like half of it or I just have not remembered any of it um, anyway, they're fighting. Penryn is like watching like, oh my god, what's happening to Raffi? Um, but then, oh my god, she gets grabbed by one of the scorpion creatures that's like wriggling on the floor and it's trying to attack her and ooh, stinger! And she gets stung by the scorpion and she immediately, immediately starts to go like paralyzed. Raffi is still like beating up this dude, the dude is beating up him and then he notices Penryn and he's like, no! And he goes to Penryn and he holds her and he's like sad because he thinks she's dead. She's he, He's like fully convinced she's dead and he's like very visibly upset. But he's just kind of like um, shushing her like hey, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be fine. And she's just, she looks like she's slowly dying. And then that other angel is just like, hmm, so you have a human pet. Hmm, how hypocritical of you. And then the other angels are like... You just go lay here with your dying little pet, I guess. Uh, we're leaving because there's an attack going on outside. So they leave. Raffi is like really, really upset because he thinks Penryn died. So he takes her body in his arms and he goes all the way up. And this scene is written in like slow motion. I really thoroughly enjoyed this scene. I did. <laughs> I liked it. It's like written is in like slow motion and he just walks with her body in his hands with the most like dead angry broken expression on his face like like he had just lost everything that he ever cared for you know that kind of vibe and he's walking with her body in his hands and his wings are spread out because they have like knives on them and he can't really control them yet so he's like he's keeping them out so he's just walking there with his wings like that holding her body looking badass and very angry and he just slowly walks out the building he flies up he walks somewhere else he's like ugh, all over the place and then he brings her body to obi and his men who are waiting near a, like a truck and Paige and the mom are also already there and he just 
walks over to them. It's like This is like a slow motion scene. The burning building is behind him. His giant black wings spread out, holding her body. It looked pretty cool in my opinion. And it's like, it's cool. Like it, It's a good ending to that. Like You can tell that he really, really cares about her. Uh, which could have been dragged out throughout the book a little bit more. So you would be a tiny bit more invested in this relationship. And then this scene would have been like tear jerking because he thinks she's dead. You know, it's a good scene. I like it. And then he just lays her body down with them. Um, at first they don't really want to take the, her body with them because they all think she's dead. Um, but Paige lifts her up because Paige is really strong now, I guess. Um, and just drags her into the in the car and they drive off and um, Penryn is just slowly slowly gaining more movement again the the venom of the scorpion is wearing off like the the attack ha was went really well Obi's attack the angels loads of angels were dying I guess everything was good and they just drive off triumphantly and the family is back together but Paige is different now and when Penryn looked up while she was still paralyzed in the car she could see Rafi flying above the car to see if she was there kind of just to check up on them um so she knew Rafi was also safe so that is the ending of the book um as you can tell, there's a part two. There's also a part three. I don't know yet if I'll read them. But maybe if you want me to do another chaotic review, I might read it. But let's get over my thoughts first. Because I've already shared a few of my thoughts. But I have some more. I just want to discuss a few more. So, of course, the thing about Paige. She, she is now a mutant. I don't know. Like a Frankenstein child, I guess. Um, but it is obvious that these children that are modified like this that they are those low demons that have been eating the humans um that's quite obvious to me because they did the same gagging spitting thing after eating angel and it seems to me the angels have taken the children with them modified them so they are like attack monsters and they only like to eat human flesh and not angel flesh but then there's the thing of Rafi saying a name can be very powerful or there's power to a name or something like that he said page of which Penryn remembers when she calls out for page and page's body kind of like wakes up which is like a cool concept but I don't understand how that would work because then the angels have like this giant like almost catalog like a collection of human children who are basically dead until you call out their name but do you really think the angels went out to kidnap these children and then also ask like oh well what what's your name I'll write that down or ask their parents or whatever like no so how would that work? Do they just have the children's names somewhere? You need the name to activate the monster child, I guess. I don't know. It's weird. Maybe it's explained in part two, but that just confused me. So some more thoughts. Again. The 17 year old stuff. A lot of things that happen in this book are down to relationships with older men. And being extremely sexualized. And she is 17. And there is no need for her to be 17. There really is no need. Could have been 25. Would have been perfectly fine. She would have had 7 extra years of training. So she could have been even more badass, I guess. I just don't understand. She didn't have to be 17. Also, I wasn't too sure on like the um, target audience for this book. Because of course, it's young adult fiction then the main character is also young adult she's 17 that kind of makes sense however a lot of what is written in this book is extremely graphic and gory i just feel like this is like a 16 plus maybe book you want the audience to be teenagers but the only teenagers that can read it are like 16 16 and up so your target audience is 16 to 18 is that it? I'm a bit confused on who this book was written for. What else? The ableism in the book. Just the thing with her mother being described as insane the entire time. And also those comments about disabled children. And really, really extremely infantilizing 
page while she is still paralyzed. Um, also, did not sit right with me. On a note, the main character, so Penryn, is the only cool girl in the story with a name as well. That's also something I noticed. Because her mom is crazy, her sister is a little girl, and then every other woman who is mentioned in the book is only described as being slutty. None of the other women know how to fight or know how to do anything. And herself, sexualizing herself and going out to um, like the way she got into the airy, she did that, but then on the same time she is completely dragging down the other women who try to do the same thing. Then she's like, oh yeah, but you must remember that she they're doing this probably for food, because this is maybe the only way they can get food. Yeah, exactly, but why are you still dragging them down at the same time? It's written in a bit of a weird way, it's not like they're doing this because it is needed. And they're doing this for themselves. And I was like, they're being slutty. You must remember they kind of do need it though. But still they're being slutty. It's kind of more, it reads in a way, that, it reads in that way. It makes me feel icky. So all the other women are described as slutty. Or Aryan, apparently. Um, and every other character that actually has like a full name and has more of an interesting storyline they're all men i don't know if that's to make her seem even cooler or just internalized misogyny maybe but it kind of sometimes gives me pick me vibes throughout the book which this book was written in 2011 and 2011 young adult fiction definitely gives pick me vibes at a lot of points so it fits the genre a lot of Penryn's thoughts are the same. There's not a lot of depth in there. Um, a lot of them are, oh my gosh, Rafi is like so hot. And then the second thought is, oh, the way he just expressed 1% of an emotion makes him seem so human. So yeah, apparently being hot and expressing like any sort of very slight emotion um, and seeming human are like the qualities we look for in men. Not a lot of that. I do do really, 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 really enjoy the idea of the angels being like terrible. Uh, but the story also makes it a tiny bit confusing because it is not explained why the angels are attacking. Still at the end of the book, it's not really explained. It's not explained why the angels are bad. But apparently there's also like some friction in between the angels and some are good and some are bad and then you have all those science experiments and everything and you kind of like you're supposed to look at it like angels are bad and Rafi is maybe the only good one but in general I'm not really sure what to focus on now I'll I guess I'll keep my mind on angels are bad except Rafi also his real name is Raphael and that's why Rafi is supposed to be pronounced as Raphael, Raphael, um, and it's like a whole revelation at the end, like, oh my gosh, you're Raphael? Like one of the archangels. Oh, girly. Um, but I didn't really realize that because I have been pronouncing Raphael as Rafi the entire book, so my brain just didn't go to Raphael, which for other people it may have gone a bit sooner, like, I, I did not catch that, but let's just, um, I'm not smart either, I'm not saying I am smart. Only the thing about the dad, it's not explained much in the book, but he either walked out on them after they found out her mom had schizophrenia or after her mom had the thing where Paige got paralyzed, which is um, both a very weird situation to me because this, this man walked out on these people's lives because he thought he couldn't deal with this either the schizophrenia or the paralyzation of his daughter and uh, to the hands of his wife he couldn't deal with his wife anymore so he left and then he left the children with his wife after she apparently judging from how the like the scenes and whatever the the, the hints threw a two-year-old child down the stairs and paralyzed her 
and you left your children there. Weird. But I think that was from most of my like thoughts on the book in general. I enjoyed it. Um, it was very like the writing is not that great, but that also makes it very like a light read. Reads very quickly. I was through this very quickly. I wanted to keep reading. I wanted to know what kept happening. There were just a lot of things that made me feel really, really icky. You do have to remind yourself that this was written 11 years ago. Um, so I do like set the bar a tiny bit lower, but still, especially comparing disabled children to something you think looks like a demon is just really weird. And I'm really glad I bought this book in the thrift store none of the money went exactly to um, the writer because I don't know if I want to support that. But that's also why I thought this video would be fun to make because it is quite a fun story. The concept of angels being evil is very fun to me. Like you can do a lot with that. I feel like in this book not enough was done with it. I don't know how much will be done in the second book. Maybe I'll read it and find out someday maybe it won't i'm just quickly gonna finish up this look and whatever i'm gonna get to you with my predictions for book number two and we'll you know i'll, I'll talk you out of the video be right back so this is the full look don't know how happy i am with it but it's definitely angel inspired let's quickly go over my predictions for book number two because of course we have a bit of an open ending the angels are still here um, Benrin and Rafi are not together, so what are we gonna expect? Well, one thing that was mentioned throughout the book was that Rafi is agnostic and doesn't believe that God exists, which is a bit weird to me since he was actually created by God at the beginning of times, but, um, you know, he, I th he kind of hinted at some kind of theory that Gabriel, the previous messenger, he was the only one who actually had contact with God. All the other angels did not. And he hinted that maybe God does not exist. And maybe Gabriel just used that power as like, I'm the messenger to just put out everything that he himself wanted. So I don't know, that's a fun theory. Could be fun. Like maybe we figure out in the next few chap in the next few books that God indeed does not exist. Um, and Gabriel was indeed just being like um, a, a tyrant, just controlling all the angels on his own. One thing that I did read in like a Goodreads review was someone predicted that maybe the mom would not be, in, would not end up actually being schizophrenic, but just all those illusions, delusions, and whatever she she's had over the past few years are actually like real things because of course now we have seen the demons and such exist so maybe like you find out that she isn't schizophrenic but everything that she saw was true for example but that actually make maybe makes it even worse that you write an entire book painting someone who is schizophrenic as absolutely insane and murdering people and whatever um and then go back to oh but she wasn't schizophrenic though so I don't know how I would feel about that if that happened. I'm thinking human working together with angel revolution. Because of course Rafi is the fallen angel now. He will not be able to be the messenger anymore. And we'll get a new messenger tyrant. And we'll figure out that God doesn't exist. And then um, Rafi and Penrin will work together. And lead the angel revolution. And um, then the angel political system will be all good. And um, the, the angels and the humans will live together in peace. And they'll somehow find a fix or something for all those children that have been mutilated and turned into demons. And maybe Rafi will never get his white wings back. Because I think he actually looks like... Would look badass with the bad wings. And also it gives me like... Ryzen vibes from A Court of Thorns and Roses. Also, I think that she might start a relationship with Obi, or at least there will be hinting of some, because of course Rafi is kind of out of the big out of the picture now. He has moved, and also angels are not supposed to be together with humans. Um, 
And she is back in Obi's camp now and in Obi's care after being stung by that scorpion. So maybe something will blossom there and then of course there will be a love triangle. That's something I think would happen. What else do we think? I have no idea what else would happen. But um, that was my very all over the place review and get ready with me. Uh, about Angel Fall by Suzanne E. Let me know what your thoughts are. Have you read the book? I had never heard of the book before, so I don't know if I know anyone who has read it, but let me know if you have read it, what your thoughts are on it, and let me know if I should read part two and do another of these videos on it or not, because I'm kind of curious, but I also don't want to really spend the time on it if it's not something that you guys want to see so let me know um if you enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me if you want to see even more from me my blog my socials and my gaming channel and everything else you need to know about me is all linked down below so you can check that out as well and that's gonna be it for me today i want to thank you for watching and i'll see you next time toodles